thanks to me again. Um, and I just start screen sharing. Um, so thank you, Miriam, and thank you all for joining us today. Um, and I'll just briefly introduce uh, the series that is brought to you by Global Tapestry of Alternatives and Global Dialogue for Systemic Change, Dialogue on Alternatives in the Times of Global Crisis. So very similar to the working group, um, the emergence of Global Tapestry of Alternatives lies in recognizing that we are currently dealing with multiple forms of global crisis, ranging from biodiversity loss, climate change, excessive pollution, resulting in very severe inequalities and deprivations, um, also resulting in many conflicts and rise of authoritarianism. And this increased uh, uh, and continued project of colonization and homogenization, which is of course resulting in a lot of personal crisis of alienation, depression, meaning lessness in lives. And with the COVID pandemic, which is very closely linked to these other global crises, we see these crises even more starkly. And uh, you, people who've been blinded to look at the repercussions of these crises can see it more clearly. But these crises are being responded to um, in a form of resistance, like what is happening currently in India with farmers resisting against uh, state policies. Um, but also in other parts of the world, which we saw with Black Lives Matter and what's happening in Latin America. And basically these all movements in many ways are articulating different ways of being, knowing, working and dreaming. Not just through their resistance, but also through their constructive alternatives, which we see across the world, um, emerging in forms of various cosmologies, worldviews and philosophies of how we can organize ourselves in different ways and different social lives. So um, the Global Tapestry of Alternatives is not a project, it's not an organization, it's a process which, is, which intends to create the spaces of collaboration, learning and exchange among these radical alternatives across the world, um, creating a space to offer active solidarity whenever they are threatened, uh, importantly, importantly creating a visibility to alternatives which we don't really come to know about, we don't see them often, we don't get to know about them, and hence creating these spaces of dialogue as well, supporting and inspiring on other alternative initiatives um, and creating a critical mass for a macro change, something that concerns all of us of how do we really bring about this macro change and hence creating that uh, group of or collectives of people to actually bring that about and stimulating collective visions of just world um, through dialogue, through more collaborations. Can we actually get together in collective envisioning? And you can read more about the Global Tapestry and what we are doing um, on this website. And we have been organizing these webinars to actually bring a lot of these uh, visions together, which started with uh, our colleagues from South Africa sharing about potential for just transitions and their work during COVID pandemic, to new agriculture movement that's emerging in Bangladesh, um, towards Commons future from Europe, how indigenous communities in Mexico are responding to COVID pandemic, um, from Freud rebellion resistance and alternatives emerging from that, responses of Kurdish women's movement, and what are the technological visions that are emerging uh, from the Americas. Um, community from Peru Potato Park defending their past, envisioning their future and how they're responding to the uh, crisis. Very interesting interventions from, um, from Europe on well-being and degrowth movement, what it means for the Europe and also for, uh, and what can be the cross learnings from other parts of the world. Uh, we had a very interesting dialogue from Finland about sharing their 10,000 10, years old of winter fisheries and how uh, the responses from the polar north matter to what happens also in the global south. Uh, we were joined by women farmers and collectors from India of how they responded to the COVID pandemic and what are the alternative models that they are, uh, uh, they are imagining and creating in these times. And the, the last one was of self-determination and uh, coping with COVID pandemic from our full, uh, colleagues from Bolivia. Um, and this is the latest one, our 14 dialogue, which is being organized with Global Working Group Beyond Development, Rosa Luxemburg, Brussels Office, and Global Tapestry of Alternatives. And we are really looking forward to this very exciting dialogue on urban transformations around the world. And to just introduce this dialogue, I would invite Miriam and Mabruka to take it forward. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Shristi. And thank you to all the GTA team for co-organizing this. And also, of course, to the Rosa Luxemburg Brussels team. We are also very happy to be co-working with you. Um, I just posted in the public chat the website of the Global Working Group for those who would like to know more about it. And now I would like to introduce my co-moderator uh, today, Mabruka Mbarek. She is also co-editor of the book we will be talking about and part of the facilitation team of our working group. And she is from Tunisia, where she was part of the Constituent Assembly after the 2011 revolution. And she currently lives in the USA, where she studies a PhD in sociology at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. So uh, I now hand over to Mabruka, who will introduce her work to you on the book, <laughs> the book itself, and uh, yeah, the speakers. Thank you so much, Miriam, and thank you, Shriti. Um, it's a massive honor to work uh, with Global Tapestry of an Alternative Rosa Luxemburg um, Brussels office to weave our energy and build synergy um, and share knowledge um, and create knowledge. Um, and uh, this reminds me of uh, a person, a friend of mine, he's a, a geographer and he does documentary Habib Ayeb from, from Tunis. Um, we brought his documentary Seeds of Dignity. Uh, I have to say his documentary kind of gave me a little bit of inspiration for the, the title of this book, Seeds of Dignity. And he said, uh, you know, solidarity, it's about sharing struggles. And from sharing struggles, we can acknowledge us and know each other. So I think like what the Global Tapestry is doing and the Global Working Group Beyond Development is doing is to give voice, to give a platform for all these extraordinary transformative processes that are happening right now. And, uh, and just to, to connect and just to acknowledge we might not change the world, but we know that some parts of people are doing extraordinary work um, during the day-to-day -day life. Um, so it's, it's a massive honor. Thank you. Uh, first, I, I want to talk about the book, but first I want to thank my co-editor because this was a massive work with, um, I think it involved um, about 32 people uh, from all different countries um, with all the case studies. So I'd like to, a special thank to Yogos Velagurkis, to Rafael Hotmer, and to Ana Rodriguez, who is with us today. Um, you know, I wanted to briefly explain how this book came, uh, you know, and as a global working group beyond development, this space where we're trying to talk about systemic transformation, we realized that we were easily gravitating around um, rural places. And every time we were thinking about transformation, it was easier to just think about rural places. And we wonder why. Um, some of us thought, well, maybe because rural places are far from economic and political center where uh, agendas of domination are brewed in, in, in centers of cities. Or maybe because rural areas do have strong concepts like food sovereignty, for example, or land. The land uh, is so essential and, and, and caring for land, which is more possible in a rural place might be um, a way, uh, a, a, a way to, to, to create more transformation. So we decided that we need to dig a little further and investigate on urban area um, because urban transformation is not just about uh, urban gardens, right? So as we investigated, um, we got in touch with amazing, um, you know, activists and popular educator and, and people doing amazing work from all around the world. And we put this book together. So let me tell you very briefly what the book is about. So Cities of Dignity, alternative, urban alternatives around the world. It begins with an analysis of the political economy of the urban commons, which was drafted by Mauro Castro and Mark Marti Costa. Um, chapter two is a survey of all the existing transnational initiative and trans solidarity platforms in support of local urban transformation. And this was drafted by Marianne Manahan and Maria Cristina Alvarez, who are here with us and will present uh, the findings. The book then presents seven case studies um, of such urban transformation 
towards more democratic, sustainable, socially equitable, and anti-patriarchal relation from below in a series of case studies. The first case studies is the San Roque market of Quito, Ecuador. And that's a fascinating case that explains how markets are more just places of exchange of commodification or commodified goods, but they're a place of community building and strategy for transformation. And this was written by Ana Rodriguez, who is with us today, and Patrick Ollenstein. The, uh, the next chapter is the urban resistance of the Isadora community in Belo Horizonte in Brazil, uh, which was uh, written by Isabella. Uh, and uh, today we have uh, Juliana, who is going to comment on, on this kind of transformation and urban resistance in Brazil in light of what you all heard about this police killing that is happening right now. Um, the fifth chapter is a learning journey um, about the US and it's not what you would expect. It's about a travel of a North African person, me and an amazing person who just transitioned and she um, and they became an ancestor two months ago, uh, Elandria Williams. Um, this was an amazing chapter because we traveled together in um, Mississippi, in Birmingham, and in Detroit to meet her community and to see what they're doing. We were honored to talk and meet with people from the Smithfield Dynamit Hill Land Trust, the Automotive Free Clinic, uh, the Corporation Jackson, um, the Cass Corridor Commons, the Box Center in Detroit, the D-Town Farm. And, uh, and I just wanted to say a word about Landria. Um, that she was, she was an incredible person grounded in reality. She impersonated black feminist thoughts and she challenged my, um, my thinking about what knowledge is. And she taught me that knowledge is produced every day. It doesn't have to be written. Um, and everyday life people are doing some small act of resistance. Um, so I think that this book carried her spirit and her wisdom. And I just want to honor her memory. And, um, and for this chapter, um, I invited someone from her community in Detroit and Bryce Detroit, an artist and activist uh, in Afrofuturism and fighting against gentrification is going to talk about his amazing work in Detroit. The next chapter um, is, um, we have two chapters about slum dwellers. One is about the community, the slums of Makoko and Morocco in Lagos, Nigeria, which is written by Asume Isaac Osweka, who is going to be with us today, and Obidun Arumu. Uh, we do have a chapter on a communitarian currency experimentation written by Marion Covey and Ruth Mwangi, which is happening in Kenya. Um, chapter, the, um, chapter seven, I believe, is this extraordinary story uh, that is happening in war-torn Syria. Um, Ansar Jazim tells us about the 15th Garden uh, Food Sovereignty Network, which despite the food siege and despite the many imperialist interventions in Syria, people were able to build food sovereignty and solidarity um, to feed people. And this was this is an incredible case um, that I urge everybody to read. And the last but not least is the case of the self-determination and self-organization of the swam dweller of Burj, India. And we have today Asim Mishra and Sandeep Firmani who will tell us about um, this extraordinary um, transformation. The last chapter is a collective reflection. And we took all of these cases as in all the participants of the global working group um, were thinking about this case, but not to try to find the strategy that would work for everybody, but some strategies or some lessons or some issues that we find out. And so these, you can find them in that um, last chapter, Collective Reflection. You can download the book for free and we will put this link on the chat. Um, and now uh, we will have in order our presenter. We will start with Marianne Manahan and uh, uh, Alvarez. 
then we will have the case of, um, I believe, uh, Asim Mishra and Sandeep Virmani from India. Uh, the third presentation will be Bryce Detroit, and the fourth will be Asume uh, Osweka from Nigeria. Um, let me now present you the next uh, presenter. Um, Marianne Manahan, she is a feminist activist researcher, an academic assistant, and a PhD student in the Department of Conflict and Development Studies at Ghent University in Belgium. Prior to her post at the department, she, was, she has worked in various social movement and civil society group on different national and international campaigns and initiatives that demand equity, environmental, gender, and social justice and alternative in the last 17 years. Outside of academia, she was involved in women's and peasant, women peasant movement in the Philippines. Um, she is a co-facilitator of the Beyond Development Working Group, and she works on diverse platform of activism. Um, and uh, she holds an undergraduate degree in sociology, University of the Philippines, and a master degree in globalization and development from the Institute of Development Police Policy Management uh, at the University of Antwerp. And her co-author, Maria Christine Alvarez, she's a PhD student at the Bartel Development Planning Unit at the University of College London. She's the recipient of the 2018 um, uh, Anniversary Doctoral Scholarship Award, um, and she won a thesis award of the American Association of Geographer. Um, her PhD research examines how a resilient Metro Manila is being built in the aftermath of the 2009 flood disaster, and she has published theoretical and empirical articles in the International Journal of Urban and Regional Research and Radical Housing Journal. Uh, without further ado, I invite the two speakers um, to present their case. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mabruka. Um, our intervention will have two parts. Uh, first, I will share about the importance of trans um, national solidarity and learning platforms for radical urban transformation, while my Co-author Teen will talk about what we mean by radical urban transformation, especially in the light of broad appeals um, to retrofit urban uh, urban spaces. Um, so we want to highlight that, um, and, and we've written that in our book um, chapter, that there is a rise and expansion of transnational solidarity and learning platforms that are deeply rooted in popular struggles for the right to the city. So around housing rights, right to water, energy democracy, food provisioning and mobility, right to education and other essential services. The right to the city for us is a political ideal and slogan that centers on the power of collective action to simultaneously transform urban spaces, urban life, urban citizens, and even urban rural relationship. So this transnational, um, transnational solidarity platforms, and you, you see in, um, in one, of the, uh, one of the slides, I will come to that um, in a bit, are locally embedded, but internationally networked initiatives that share a common political project of resisting the impacts of neoliberal urbanism, such as massive um, dispossession and displacement of communities and peoples, as well as privatization of communal spaces on one hand. And on the other, they share an impetus and fundamental desire to envisage and create spaces in cities where people live in dignity and harmony with their nature. So one concrete example that is, is already um, shown in your slide is the Transformative Cities Atlas of Utopia initiative led by Transnational Institute, um, HIC, RIPES, um, Global Coalition for the Right to the City, ECOLIS, and Friends of the Earth International, in which they show how cities can be sites of radical urban transformative praxis, as well as an initiative that builds uh, and aims to build an atlas of real utopias, you know, and make them make these experiences viral, as well as share learnings that comes from implementing and building these experiments. A common case um, is the remunicipalization of privatized water and energy systems um, in which citizens, people's organizations, um, or public authorities have taken over and claimed back their water and energy systems in a radically democratic way. While these remunicipalization struggles are um, waged at the national or lo local context, um, they have an important internationalist dimension. Um, that is, many of them have one connected and learn from each other, uh, much as what, what we're doing right now, especially how transnational private companies work around the world, what strategies have worked, what strategies have not. And secondly, they have exchanged ideas and lessons in reclaiming and rebuilding public services that are anchored on 
principles of radical democracy, direct democracy, uh, principles around solidarity, equity, and, and even commoning. So for example, the Jakarta remunicipalization that it's being waged in the last um, 10 years has learned a lot from experiences in the Cochabamba water wars in 2000 in Latin America, as well as um, the takeover of Eau de Paris uh, that took over the French water national transnational's ownership of the water system in 2010. Um, uh, Mabruka, can you go into the third slide, please? So the graphic um, that I will show you shows the mapping, the amazing mapping that was done by um, Transnational Institute and its many partners, which shows that around 1,408 remunicipalization of public services, where more than 2,400 cities in 58 countries have brought public services back under public and community control um, since 2000. So it's not merely a trend, uh, but actually a counter movement of radical urban transformations and against privatization. So they involve well-focused, politically engaged approaches which aim to build horizontal and vertical alliances, as well as forge translocal and transnational solidarity to reclaim space and civic participation and even radical radicalized participation or the very concept and practice of participation. Over to you, Tin. Yes, thank you, man. So um, in closing, we just wish to emphasize our key point, which does not only underpin the cases of urban transformation discussed throughout the book, but also resonates more loudly in the wake of broad appeals in recent months to retrofit or redesign cities. And the takeaway is urban transformation is enabled by a radical urban politics centered on upholding human dignity. It is the people who drive and lead urban transformation. And by people, we mean urban citizens. And by urban citizens, we pertain not simply to a registered population, but importantly, to marginalized and impoverished groups of people who reside in cities and may hold the status of a legitimate citizen, but are nonetheless denied the right to thrive. Urban transformation is not about retrofitting a space redesigning landscapes or reconfiguring the city. It is never simply about building more parks, more bike lanes or more recreational spaces. Without fundamental changes to access, rights and political participation, design led and infrastructure focused interventions risk perpetuating and even creating more inequalities. Cities of dignity are neither brought to life by superstar architects nor designed by urban planners. Rather, they are created by practicing a radical urban politics that is centered on human dignity and grounded in principles of emancipatory social justice. That is to say, urban transformation is in the hands of the people. You put urban citizens in the driver's seat. Concretely, this means you let people determine the agenda. You don't just aim for inclusivity or participation. You let people set the terms of participation. And I will push this further by saying that you don't just radicalize participation, but perhaps importantly, foster what anthropologist James Holston calls insurgent citizenship, which is capable of building a corresponding insurgent urbanism. I think these are the ideas that tie the cases we discuss in our chapter and um, also those presented in other chapters. And um, I, I guess I will stop there and uh, let that idea simmer. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, I have to say this is a great transition, uh, Tin, because one such insurgent citizenship and transformation in the hand of people happened in Borj, India. And we have with us Sandeep Virmani, who is based in Western India, and he has worked um, in the field of housing planning infrastructure. Um, he has worked two important, he has uh, used two important methodology in his work. Um, based on participatory solution building by com combining the vigor of modern science and established community knowledge. And um, second, every solution 
He thinks that every solution should help reduce emission and increase bioindicator of ecosystem. Uh, he has worked in the Yurnarshala Foundation, which has built thousands of homes, reviving and modernizing technique of building with earth, wood, stone, and bamboo. Um, and he has worked on a process called Sanjivan, which has helped the government recognize the science of pastoral animal husbandry toward a sustainable economic production system that increased the biodiversity of grassland, torn forest, and mangrove ecosystem. Um, we have with us also Asim Mishra. Oh, I'm sorry, this was the. Um, the alarm, uh, who is a radical urban planner um, and he works for the, the program Homes in the City um, as the program director, as a matter of fact. Home in the City is an innovative program coordinated by five civil society organizations having similar philosophy, uh, working on diversity in the city of Bourges, and it's, a, it's working with issue-based collective citizens and several other organizations. They are collectively developing Bourges to be a city where citizens, particularly the urban poor, uh, improve their uh, social economic condition and access basic service through political participation and local governance. Prior to joining this program, Asim was, has worked in various civil society organizations, governmental depart departments, and academic institutions. Um, and uh, take it away. Thank you. Yeah, am I audible? Yes, you are. Could you uh, share your my, screen? Yeah, my the host will have to allow my video to come on. Okay. Asim, in the meantime, can I ask you to put the presentation on, please? Yes, I do. No, somehow my video is not coming on, but I can start the presentation if that is all right. Okay, let me start by uh, thanking Mabruka, you and Maryam for giving us this great opportunity to one, be part of this book and now to be part of this wonderful seminar that you have organized, this webinar that you have organized. Uh, I also need to actually thank Ashish and Srishti for actually recommending our case to both of you so that we could become part of this entire process over the last one year and we really thoroughly enjoyed working with all of you. Uh, uh, let me start by uh, talking to you about uh, the city of Bhuj. Uh, what uh, I see in the next slide. Uh, city, the city of Bhuj is a small city. We are about 250,000 uh, people in this city on the border of, uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of India and Pakistan. This is an arid area. And, uh, uh, but it's a very old city. It was the capital of a kingdom 500 years ago. Uh, but over the last uh, few years, especially over the last two decades after we had a big earthquake here, our city has grown from just being six square kilometers to being 56 square kilometers now. And 30% uh, uh, of this small city actually live in informal settlements, mostly uh, centered around the north of the city. And uh, this has become a kind of a north-south divide uh, for the city where uh, all the uh, uh, municipal resources tend to go to the south while uh, the north is uh, 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 always facing deprivation. Kind of a reverse situation globally, I guess. The, uh, 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 and these 30% are the people who obviously, like in every other city, provide the services uh, to the rest of the city. Yeah, next. So to, you know, our cities are such complex creatures and to try and see how we can have an equally complex response to this, we got five different organizations to come together and uh, 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 with very different skills. We also set up many CBOs, community organizations in this entire process. And the objective was that we must empower the vulnerable communities, strengthen people's democracies, and through decentralization of municipal powers, get women in the driving seat, uh, because they are so good at getting, uh, getting consensus built amongst uh, people. And of course, 
look at ecological justice, which is really held by a lot of these communities that have come from rural areas into our cities, and they know how to do it much better than we have done in our cities. So uh, uh, democratic uh, decentralization, equity, and ecological uh, uh, interventions is the, the three pillars on which we have tried to build this entire program. So as I said, we have five different uh, organizations, one working on water management, another working on urban governance, uh, third working on biodiversity conservation, a fourth working on gender equity and justice, and uh, the, uh, another working on, uh, on urban issues and urban building and infrastructure. So the five organizations came together and over the last uh, um, decade or so, we have been able to create several people's organizations. So for example, Saki Sangini is a collective of over 3000 women living in the slums. They are really the bedrock of a lot of the work that is happening in, the, uh, in this program. We also have an organization of um, uh, assorted people from across the city uh, who are uh, uh, working on the issue of water management. We'll discuss that uh, in a short while uh, for, uh, with you. We also have, actually, you know, we, we have a sangatan, a, a, a collective of people who hold animals and who provide milk and meat to the city. And uh, they are living in our slums. They provide almost 40% of our uh, food uh, uh, to the city, and, but are, are totally unrecognized. We also have a migrant workers association, a street vendors association, and a sex workers association. Uh, uh, and the whole thing is coming together in a ward. You know, the city is divided into 11 wards and they, they are legal bodies. They are the real bodies that are expected to actually do their planning and run the programs. And the municipal corporations are supposed to provide them the funds to be able to take control of their own situation. And these, uh, Asimil, can you go back a little? One slide back, yeah. And so all of us, uh, uh, the uh, organizations, the C CBOs and the, uh, uh, the NGOs are basically helping the wards and their ward committees become more powerful. We actually began with a situation where ward, there were no ward committees. And uh, over the last few years, we have been able to make sure that this uh, gets set up. And now we are trying to see that the powers are actually decentralized from the state and the municipal corporations to these ward committees. We, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, we have a unique way of functioning. What we have done is we provide fellowships. We provide fellowships to individuals within organizations or even public fellows who have an idea, who want to see how this can be converted into a pilot and be demonstrated in the city, which uh, works with the broad aims that we laid out in the beginning of our program. Yeah, next. So this is just to give you an idea of the different types of fellowships that are uh, being uh, that are being implemented. There are a huge diversity of uh, uh, people working on very diverse subjects. Uh, the ones highlighted in yellow is some uh, is uh, are some of the three case studies that we will uh, we will present to you so that you get an idea of how we function uh, on any particular subject that is taken up. So. Uh, uh, yeah, so I'll ask Asim now to give you an idea of these three case studies. Thank you. Asim, your mic is off. So now we will share a few uh, transformative demonstration that we are able to uh, demonstrate here over last one decade. So water is a precious resource in arid regions like Bhuj, and therefore our ancestors has uh, developed Bhuj on a 100 square kilometer aquifer, which was recharged through a complex system. Four large lakes uh, along with over 70 ponds uh, were developed. Uh, with three uh, rivulets connected with uh, divergent channels and aqueduct to fill these lakes in order to fulfill the water requirement of the city. Uh, the system was functional till 60, but as deep bore wells and uh, pipelines laid down to transport water from 1000 kilometers away, uh, this system was ignored and this centralized water system further marginalized 
दिस पुअर एरिया विद अनइक्वल डिस्ट्रीब्यूशन ऑफ वाटर as per acidity water enough water from the rainfall and it can fulfill the required water requirements if the old uh, system is restored and recharge facilities be developed uh, 70% of the channels and systems has been repaired by the program this is a, a colony which got flooded during monsoon as drainage projecto durante el monzón y pudimos mejorarlo. Aquí podemos ver las distintas imágenes para eliminar. Uh, water tank and then distributed in the uh, settlement and this entire uh, system is managed by the community the person is standing in the first photograph is mr dayaram he is an hic fellow and he works for water stressed areas uh, with the support technical support of act and monetary support from hic bhuj municipality and uh, from community contributions many deprived areas has been benefited due to his efforts uh, there are over 30 uh, municipal schools have been installed the uh, roof rain water harvesting systems and children from water distressed areas are known to fill their water bottles and then take back to their homes for their parents um, more than 40% of water comes from this repaired and recharged water aquifer now and these marginalized communities are managing their own water systems irrespective of municipality housing is another major issue for poor in our city about 30% of population lives in slum areas without having adequate housing and basic services Uh, a slum free city plan of action has been prepared by the program for the bhuj city that so everyone can be housed uh, uh, with ground plus one structures uh, with sparing 30 hectare land in the city and to demonstrate this approach uh, three slums having uh, about 314 houses were selected to demonstrate in the first phase uh, in the slums where sg self help groups were active and willing to take up this process the lady in the first photograph is a community leader and she is also a, a member of sakhi sangini and she help a lot to organize people engage people and uh, ensure the process these are some other photograph so Asim, perhaps could you wrap up so that we can here we have and and during the dialogue session. Okay. Uh, yeah, so we here we have uh, go to the end now. Asim, just show the pictures, then we can go ahead. So these are some of the photographs of the redeveloped site, and we also work for the for the women empowerment and. Uh, So okay, you can go to the last slide. So can you conclude, Sandeep? Yeah, take it to the last slide. Yeah. So basically, what we are uh, while we have been able to uh, you know show that it is possible to have decentralized ways of working, uh, one of the major challenges we face is how to upscale because in a right wing centralized corrupt uh, polity which is increasing over the years uh, in the last few years. Uh, we have uh, uh, a challenge of how to scale up these ideas which we are uh, still trying to work with the only way we are trying to work with on that is to make sure that the uh, the, the people the cbos are powerful and are taking the uh, the help of the judiciary in making sure that uh, their powers and their rights are given to them thank you both of you i'm sorry to cut it short and i hope that we will be able to talk more
during the question answer dialogue, especially because maybe people did not uh, fully grasp how amazing this experience is because it was the people of Bourges who just decided enough, we're gonna take over that city planning, we're gonna do this. And they did it uh, with, you know, with just the people organized, self organizes and, and, and not waiting for the local government. And the challenge of scaling uh, this transformation from the grassroots is something very interesting that we could address. Um, the next, our next speaker is Bryce Detroit. Uh, Bryce is an Afrofuturist artist, activist, and a pioneer of entertainment justice. As a cultural designer, he's an award, national award-winning music producer, performer, and curator. Through his practice, Bryce Detroit demonstrated the power of using music, entertainment, arts, and native legacy to design cultural infrastructure for preserving, producing, and promoting new diasporic African narratives. Um, in cultural literacy and cooperation neighborhood-based economy. Bryce Detroit is the 2019 New Museum Ideas City Fellows and the 2017 Night Art Challenge Award winner. A prominent community activist and advocate, Bryce Detroit grows intersectional self-determined communities as a founding member of Oakland Avenue Artist Coalition, co-founder of Detroit Community Wealth Fund, director of the Cultural and Center for Community-Based Enterprise and international delegate for the East Michigan Environmental Action Council. Um, Bryce is gonna tell us about his campaign, which is Hood Clothes uh, to uh, Gentrifier, which I, I have this, uh, uh, sweater here and please do check his website I will put it on the chat and his uh, latest album Structured Water. Take it away Bryce. Awesome. Uh, boom and there's a video I'm going to see if this sh screen share works. Uh, is my screen being shared? It is yes. Okay awesome. So let me uh, make sure Okay, peace everyone. I am Bryce Detroit. Uh, my practice is called Entertainment Justice. Uh, boom, first off, before going there, let me put my timer on because <laughs> I have a tendency to speak long. Um, wanna bring my ancestors into the space. So first I'm going to acknowledge my maternal grandmother, Susan Sappho Chavis, Ashe, my maternal grandfather, Alonzo Clemens Anderson, Ashe. My paternal grandmother, Mildred Willoughby Small, Ashe. And my paternal grandfather, uh, Wilbert Franklin Small Sr., Ashe. So my, my practice is called Entertainment Justice. Uh, I'm approaching, created this practice for myself 10 years ago as a record producer, songwriter, performing artist, um, extracting myself out of a corporate music space, corporate entertainment space, knowing that my skill sets existed in the realm of behavior science, um, being responsible for creating content, uh, producing content that effectively influences particular points of self-identity, as well as uh, influences for certain points of behavior modification, um, particularly the consumer. So extracted myself from that uh, career track um, in 2009 to bring my skills to service for my people. Um, in particular, looking at what is the way that entertainment art uh, can intersect from a racial justice perspective, can intersect with social justice, climate justice, and economic justice um, to support these movements in a very concrete way. So one way that supporting movements, uh, particularly as it relates to um, placekeeping and place making in my Detroit neighborhood, which is called the North End, uh, one way that that's looked is uh, have been doing programming um, for the last six, seven, well, in my neighborhood for the last seven years, for sure, but throughout Detroit for the last 10 years. And this entertainment programming uh, 
with the emphasis on using entertainment art to create opportunities, uh, entertainment art at the intersection of design and architecture as well, to create opportunities for diasporic African people to investigate, question, uh, affirm, celebrate points, positive points of ancestrally rooted identity and lifestyle, looking at that as a prerequisite for a person being able to be in their agency, present in their own agency, um, and then self-actualize to their heart's desires. I'm gonna go back to this slide right here, Detroit African. So created this phraseology for myself in 2012 as a decolonizing mechanism. Uh, one thing that personally have acknowledged uh, one of the things that makes it challenging for a diasporic African born in America to actually see themselves as the custodian of their built environment, the architect designer of their built environment, uh, the determiner of their reality uh, is a colonized point of self-identity that exists within their imagination. It is a very common uh, peculiar phenomenon where many diasporic Africans born in Detroit, I mean, born in America, the image that we hold in our imagination of ourself is usually it starts off as a, a descendant of slavery, uh, a human citizen who exists as a, as a part of a global slave class that only has five to 600 years of history that primarily start in America, uh, a self image and identity that that shows themselves usually being on the short end of all of the proverbial sticks, um, the oppressed, the disadvantaged, starting from there and starting from that point of identity and that point of narrative, then it makes it challenging uh, for many to actually get to a point in their life where they see themselves in their imagination as the champion, as the successful being, as the determiner of their reality, as one who has perfect agency uh, in, in how they self-actualize. So uh, being very clear on that, then doing programming that supports the self-identity, cultivating uh, healed, healthy, radiant points of self-identity. And then it's from there uh, that we can present new ideas through music and through architecture, new ideas uh, that inspire new imaginations. And in these new imaginations, um, we can see ourselves in these affirmed ways, imagining ourselves actually taking control of our built environment, actually leading processes in our, in our communities, in our neighborhoods, actually um directing and guiding the course of our own life and manifestation of our own reality um and putting that as a context because this conversation about gentrification um that i'm having through my new project called uh the project is called road work and the first installation in the road work series is hood close to gentrifiers for me uh, this project, which was just recently launched in September, have a minute left, launched in September. The point of it was for me to officially broadcast my own personal politic. Um, let me stop this because I'm not effectively <laughs> scrolling through my slides. But um, for me to project my own personal politic in my neighborhood, in particular on the, um, in the places where my own land use strategies are being deployed, like where my own neighborhood development work is happening. Put this sign there so that the writing is on the wall, so to speak, um, as a point of neighborhood diplomacy, making it clear what are the codes and cultural standards that we have here. Uh, hood closed to gentrifiers is also uh, the second part of an affirmation 
the hood is closed to gentrifiers because first, for the past 10, 15 years, there are people in my neighborhood, including myself, who have opened up new opportunities and avenues for self-development, collective leadership development, as well as um, bringing in our own resources to purchase underserved, underutilized land and then develop it based on our own indigenous cultural context. Uh, so that's the full sentence. We have opened up new opportunities to develop our own places in our own neighborhoods based on our ancestrally rooted points of identity and lifestyle. Therefore, we are closed to conventional business as usual, which typically looks like outsiders coming in, uh, inserting their imagination, invisibilizing and displacing culture and economy, inserting a white body architectural imagination on our scenario, and then constructing environments um, that do not serve us socially, culturally, politically, or economically. Uh, my timer went off, so I'm aware that that was eight minutes. Uh, this is a very full conversation. I'm grateful for this space and look forward to more time during the discussion part. Thank you, Bryce. And we're so grateful to have you here um, and hear about your campaign. Um, next uh, is Asume, uh, who is going to tell us about uh, what's going on in uh, Nigeria, in Lagos, Nigeria. Uh, Isaac Asume Osweka coordinates the Social Action International, an organization promoting resource democracy, climate justice, and human rights in West Africa through research and monitoring popular education and advocacy in solidarity with communities, activists, and scholars. Asume's research and advocacy focus on energy, oil and gas, climate change and conflict, trade, and debt. Asume previously served as coordinator of All Watch Africa, a network of organizations supporting communities impacted by the petroleum industry in the continent. He holds a doctorate in environmental studies from York University in Canada, uh, where he has been a member of faculty and visiting scholar. Um, Asume uh, is also a participant of the Global Working Group Beyond Development. To you, Asume. Thank you, Mabroka, and uh, thanks, comrades. Um, I appreciate the, the opportunity to be part of this this collective and to, and to have contributed together with uh, my comrade Abiodun Aremo to this uh, this volume. Uh, our chapter focuses on Makoko uh, in in Lagos. Lagos is uh, the commercial capital of uh, Nigeria, the largest city in in Africa. And uh, Abiodun, my, my colleague who co-authored this chapter with me is uh, actually more rooted in, in the community in, in Lagos. And uh, he has been, he has had an intimate relationship with what we, we, we discuss in, in the chapter. He has been part of a uh, movement for housing rights. Uh, he has struggled with uh, slum dwellers from the from the 19 late 1980s and 19, 1990s and he's still very much involved uh, we work together in the pro democracy movement in, in Nigeria we continue to work together promoting uh, popular alternatives uh, promoting pan africanist understanding and anti colonial uh, education in in Nigeria uh, so makoko uh, the community that uh, we talk about is uh, described as uh, a floating slum, and uh, there are some people, particularly Western Western tourists and Western journalists, have described it as uh, the Venice of Africa, uh, and, and 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 such romanticization. Um, makes it attractive to the tourists from from europe uh, especially who who make sure to visit uh makoko anytime they they are in in, in lagos 
Uh, however, the, the the story of uh, Makoko is is more than that. It is a story of solidarity, story of uh, struggles, and stories of contested visions for social change and for urban transformation in in, in Lagos. Uh, the, the the story of Makoko speaks to the reality of marginalization and dispossession of the poor in urban planning. Yeah, it is about a community with some of the most impoverished people in Lagos uh, who are making a claim to being a legitimate part of the city, uh, a, a legitimate part of the population and the, and the landscape of the city. Fundamentally, the story of Makoko shows how colonialism shaped and continued to shape urban development and how the, the character of uh, uh, former colonies like Nigeria remain fundamentally unchanged. Uh, so urban development in Nigeria from, from the colonial beginnings was part of the process of uh, the plunder involving the addictions and the, of indigenous communities to make way for the needs of corporations and, and, and the powerful elite. We find with the story of uh, Makoko that the character of the, of the state remains changed. Makoko is a story of radical transformation in practice, which is beauty and many imperfections, uh, as we'll, I will see. There's a story of the rural poor standing up to the state and insisting on the, on the right to share the city space. Now, uh, Makoko is an indigenous community, a uh, fishing community that uh, survived the creation of Lagos. Lagos was, as a city, was created by British colonialists uh, that sought to build an administrative center and a, a port for their, their commerce, for their trade, and also for their colonial project. And in the process of doing that, many of the indigenous communities were, evacu were, were evicted from, from, from their settlements and moved to the, to the margins. Uh, many of those people uh, moved to areas like Makoko or Morocco, which were at, in the margins, you know, and these places were not actually part of the original city plan. Uh, but there they existed, doing their thing, mostly existed as fishermen, as the population of Lagos grew, particularly following independence, you know, so-called independence in, in night, night tea city, more people continue to flock into the city of Lagos. And those who, uh, because of their economic status, because of their low income or unemployment, could not afford to rent a room uh, in the, uh, in, in, you know, the planned city ended up in, in places like Morocco or Makoko. And what, people did was to actually go dive into the water with their bare hands, with buckets, and reclaimed, dredged the, the, the land, reclaimed soil, and built on, on top of on top of it. So it was it was a, a self-reclamation project, getting land to build on. And that continued for for a while. But with more people moving in to the, the areas, people now started to introduce uh, a, a kind of architecture that was already uh, common in the mangroves of the Niger Delta, you know, where people uh, build houses on, on stilts. And so the houses are, are above uh, water. And that is why Bakoko is referred to as the floating, floating, slum and this 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 continued into the the 80s and 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 the 90s and while hundreds of thousands of people were subsisting and living their lives in in makoko in morocco and other slum settlements in, in, in the coastal slum settlements the states basically ignored them uh, there were no social amenities infrastructure state infrastructure did not touch the areas the people had to provide everything for themselves. Many of these people, of course, didn't just exist in, in, in Makoko. Some of them 
the, the major occupation of the people in these areas is fishing. Uh, and so there was there's a, there's a major fishing industry in, in, in the area, people, you know, and there are people uh, involved in processing of the fish. There are those that go to catch fish. There are those like the woman that we see on the screen are smoking the, the fish and the fish is sold in the city of Lagos and in other areas. There are those that are also involved in canoe making, the canoe, the craft that is used for fishing. The people carve it with woods, you know, in, in, that, in that area. There are people that are providing services, hairdressers, barbers, those establishments exist in the, in the community. Uh, there are many people in, in, in those communities that actually that work outside of uh, the area, you know, even civil servants, even police officers who cannot afford poorly paid uh, workers uh, in the factories who cannot afford accommodation elsewhere end up uh, in slums uh, like uh, Makoko. Things began to change for these communities from the late 80s, and particularly from 1990, following the construction in Lagos of what the, what the, the Ted Mainland Bridge in, in Lagos. This bridge that connects to two sections of uh, Lagos uh, carries very heavy traffic. And you know there are a lot of people that move between the mainland and the island of Lagos for work each each day, you know, with millions of people actually. And it's come to, you know, the building of the bridge uh, it, you know, that was commissioned around 1990 exposed the, the community, exposed Makoko, uh, Maroko and Makoko and other similar communities to the people. Uh, that uh, did not see those places before. Uh, and so it presented a stark picture. You know, the, the, it did not, Bakoko did not seem to fit into the picture uh, of uh, what uh, a, a city should look like. It was, it, it seemed poor, it seemed dirty and, and all of that. And beginning from 1990, the military government at that time started a, a process of uh, demolishing the, the slums, begin, beginning with uh, Morocco. So there was major demolition uh, uh, in, in Morocco. People were basically forced out, uh, their homes were bulldozed without any notice. You know, it was like, you know, a day or two notice was given to them and the next, the next thing bulldozer, bulldozers came in and that was a major tragedy. Uh, that resulted in the first evictions of hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, those that, that were evicted from Morocco without compensation ended up in, some of them ended up in uh, Makoko and continued to live their lives until, until 2012 when a pro, a, a, an eviction program was commenced by the Lagos state government post-military government in Lagos State. And it's important to point out the, the impact of uh, neoliberal economic practices that was introduced via structural adjustment originally in, in, the, in the 1980s and how this led to, to restructuring of the, of, of the economy in favor of uh, free market, the so-called free market privatization uh, and the, in, the increasing inequality that ensued, the loss of jobs, particularly public sector jobs due to retrenchments uh, 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 following privatization of uh, publicly owned enterprises. All those contributed to the swelling up of the population of cities uh, like Makoko. But the, image, the, the rich that emerged, the, the wealthy that emerged uh, you know, during it as part of that privatization process, those that took advantage of uh, public the public wealth were the ones who now targeted the land that the people had created for themselves in places like Morocco and Makoko and sought to to promote a new a vision of urban renewal that involves you know. Western style waterfront development uh, that had absolutely, you know, in which the people in places like Makoko were not part of that uh, picture. So a struggle, a struggle started, particularly uh, people, people re remembered what happened in 1990 when Morocco was, was, was demolished. And this time they said, look, they were not going to accept, they were not going to allow. So there was mobilization, there was solidarity 
and the people stood up. There were a lot of protests and insisted that it will not happen this time, that Mark, Mark Coco will not be, be, be evicted. What? Thank you, uh, Asumi. I'm going to ask you to um, wrap up. And also, you know, maybe in the dialogue, we can talk about uh, Makuko Morocco um, in light of the recent police killing uh, during the dialogue session. So I'll ask you to wrap up. Thank you. Okay, uh, so just just to just to wrap up, uh, I, I I remember the the point that uh, Maria made earlier in in, in uh, pre presentation. Even Bryce just 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 before me pointing out that the, you know in having visions of uh, urban transformation, that it is important to consider what works for the people in the, in the area, that urban, urban renewal or urban transformation should not be based on the uh, outsiders inciting, inserting their, their, their architectural imagination into the environment. Uh, this is exactly what we, we saw in Makoko at the, at the end of the day, in the process of collaboration, partnerships, to try to see, you know, to protect Makoko. We saw a situation where Alternative ideas, uh, particularly architectural ideas, sometimes supported by international development agencies, came to dominate. Uh, and sometimes these these ideas didn't didn't find you know, get traction in in the community. And ultimately, some of the pilots that were constructed did not last because they did, were not rooted in the local on knowledge and on, on, on understanding. And so that is also part of the things you know, that we need to understand uh, going forward in these discussions. While solidarity, while partnerships are important to protect housing rights, it is important that the, 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 the power of the victims or the power of the people, the marginalized, should be protected in the processes. Let's stop there. Thank you, Asume. And uh, like I said, in the question and dialogue, I'm sure a lot of people will have an answer, a question about what's going on right now and, and the struggle of Makoko and Morocco. Next, um, so I would like to thank all our speakers um, and introduce Juliana Moraes de Guz. She has generously accepted to comment on the book. Juliana was a member of the regional articulation of Afro descended from Latin America and the Caribbean. She's a PhD student in sociology at UMass Amherst. She holds a master's degree in political science, a BA in political science from University of Brasilia. She has published articles, the success science and epistemology situated knowledge in the review, uh, in the feminist review, um, as well as theor theoretical analytical approach on prostitution. Currently, Juliana is working on a book manuscript called Du Bois on Latin America and the Caribbean, Trans-American Pan-Africanism and Global Sociology, co-author with Professor Agustin Laumontes and uh, Jorge, Dr. Jorge Vasquez from uh, UMass Amherst. Additionally, uh, Juliana is studying the connection between decolonial praxis, urban politics, and black movements in Latin America. Her dissertation theme, which is her dissertation theme. Juliana also, goes all, also works in a wide range of social movement in the Americas. In particular, she has collaborated with sex workers organization in the struggle for workers' rights, with urban land settlement organized by black and poor people and with anti-prison movements. In the last three years, she has focused and strengthened the connection between black movements and the Americas. Thank you, Juliana. Hello, um, good morning, at least here it's morning. I would like to thank especially my broken Henrian for the invitation. It's a pleasure to comment this book that I, come, uh, that I think comes in a very important moment, right? So um, uh, we, we know that recently population and world population is becoming each time more urban. Uh, in that the urban has its specificities about how we can create another world in urban spaces. So um, I have, when I was reading the book, our, our authors of the book, they already show quite clear um, the connections between urban spaces and cities as a result and facilitators of capitalism. So taking this into consideration, I really appreciate to be able to comment this book. 
Um, I'd like to add a little bit uh, and connect it especially with Latin America and Brazil that and from Brazil, so it was requested to do. Um, that beyond being connected with urban, with capitalism, cities has been defined by academics and politicians as the spatial representation of Western modernity. Uh, we can take since from the beginning of urban studies, for example, being urban is associated with being modern, with embodied uh, individualistic, competitive, capitalist culture. And we, we can, in Latin America, especially, we have since the 60s very strong development discourses that promoted urbanization as the way to reach a kind of colonial mindset of what development is. Um, and impose it, uh, global north cities as models to the global south. So even nowadays, you have organizations such as the World Bank and the United Nations uh, pushing kind of good practices in urban planning that are in, that are rooted in this kind of idea. Uh, in Latin America, this has been particularly strong. We had. Uh, and I'm going to focus on our indigenous and black movements. Um, we have secured since the 80s, more or less, more than uh, a lot of the rights to territory, especially based on the recognition of um, our ancestral groups. So we have something like a, an area a little bit larger than Mexico recognizes as territories of indigenous and Afro descendant movements in Latin America. Um, most of them protected by the Convention 169, that is the Convention um, of Tribal Treat People. But most of these communities are in rural areas. And although this, and how many of the institutions look at us, it is us, the savage, the group who live in these rural areas. Que vienen muchas de estas zonas. Y... Um, which it's not, not does not mean that communities and ancestral communities do not exist in urban areas. Indeed, in Brazil, we have many Maroon communities in big cities recognized by the state, but uh, often when we claim the right to our land, um, how countries have pictured us that if you're in an urban space, you cannot access uh, the politics that, that ensure rights to ancestral communities. So again, this is just one of the examples of the importance to consider the specificity of the urban for the social struggles for social justice. Um, I want to add here, I'm not saying that um, being urban, uh, that the urban space, it's a little, it's above the rural area, it's not. Uh, and I think the book makes a great, uh, one of the contributions to this, of this book is to make great connections between urban and rural struggles. Um, but to understand, if you don't, if you understand the specificities of what it engages, create alternative words, create another word in, in the space, we hardly can build strategies that are successful. So this is one of the biggest contributions of this book. However, I would like to challenge, bring some challenges in dialogue with um, what we have read and what the, presentation, the presentations have talked also. That is the importance to understand the connection between race and the denial of spatial existence. So since slavery, um, part of the how black people have been dehumanized is denying to us right to spatial dimensions, one of the basic dimensions of, of human being, right? Um, this has happened with displacements, this has happened with murders, this has happened with imprisonment. And in particular nowadays, cities have been sites of transformation, but also one of the biggest sites of violence, especially of homicides and police killings. And um, this is a phenomenon that happens in the United States, but also in Brazil and other countries of Latin America. A, a big part of population in prison are also coming from urban areas. So when you think about that, uh, and some of the chapters really bring the idea of how like urban development policies, they talk about cleaning the space, cleaning about to hide, make, uh, be, transform the space in a more hygienic space. Uh, many people have denounced how these ideas of cleansing are connected with the idea of erased blackness, of erased uh, whitening the space. 
And that is what has guided, uh, we cannot talk about gentrification as separated from that. And you cannot talk about, talk about displacement as separate from that. Um, uh, some of, uh, in the particular chapter on Brazil, for example, many communities that are struggling to create another world in urban spaces are mentioned. And it's important to say that um, I know, I know, I know in person, many of them, they are majority black and led by black women. Um, so when you think also about what is to create a new world in urban cities, we are still dealing with extremely, with the increasing of public security policies, increasing surveillance, incarceration, and um, violence, in these kinds of violence, right? Because you have other kinds uh, in urban communities, literally denying to us, not only our neighborhood, but the rights to our own bodies, right? Uh, so that when we're talking about spatial existence, it's important to think that we're not only saying, oh, I want, it's important to have my neighborhood safe. Nowadays, the situation has come to the point that we're talking about having our, our body not murdered, not raped, not put in prison, right? Um, so I, I put my timer here, so I'm sorry that I look all the time to the side, but I'm trying to, I, I have a tendency to talk too much too. So I'm trying to <laughs> be short. Um, so the book brings, so to conclude, because I'm close to eight minutes, uh, the book brings amazing contributions for us to think about uh, exactly what is the connection between the rural and the urban? How can we challenge the spatial representation of Western modernity? How can you challenge any kind of association between being urban and being white or being urban and incorporated capitalism and be urban and, and embody development, this development discourses. And this is central for the struggles nowadays. Um, but it's also important and to, con to continue to talk and to embrace and to reflect on how race has coordinated many of the urban the transnational urban policies that has been implemented nowadays. Uh, denying for everybody from racialized bodies, not only blacks, but for all racialized bodies, uh, any access, any to the a basic dimension of being human that is space. Right? So I conclude by saying that and saying that it's a quite uh, important book and I recommend everybody reading. I was very pleasured with all the, and amazed by all the work that was done and congratulate the co-workers for this amazing work. Thank you very much, Juliana, especially for pointing out the dimension of racialization and uh, yeah, bridging with Bryce's and also Asume's talk on this. Thanks for the great comment. Now I would like to ask all uh, authors of the book and uh, members of the core group of the Global Tapestry of Alternatives and of our working group and of Rosa Luxemburg Foundation who are in this inner room to turn their cameras on so that people can see us all for a moment. And I would like to invite first, we are going now to dialogue about what we have heard and um, we all already have some questions, some interesting questions in the questions and answers. Anyway, I invite you to put some more in there. If you have any comments also, they are very welcome. And uh, we would now first have a quick round of comments or questions between these organizers of the event or, and part of the processes who have brought us here. So uh, yeah, welcome anyone who wants to speak. Yes, Ashish, maybe you just briefly introduce yourself before speaking. Sure, thanks uh, uh, Miriam, I'm Ashish Kothari. I work in India with an environmental action group uh, Kalpavrik, and I'm also a member of the Global Working Group on Beyond Development and a core team member of the Global Tapestry of Alternatives. So it's been a pleasure to help uh, organize this. Um, I think that was an amazing, I mean, 
uh, what I felt most was that eight minutes simply didn't do justice to the kind of uh, complexity and depth of each of these case studies. Uh, but I know we have limited uh, time on these webinars. Uh, but it was fantastic introduction, and I especially like the sort of com you know the kind of combination of we what we heard was cities of dignity, but also cities of indignity, and what are the sort of uh, contestations between the two. <clears throat> My uh, question follows a little bit from what Juliana said uh, towards the end, um, which is much of the discussion and the case studies as presented have been on the urban. And I'm wondering how the panelists or the authors would like to look at the relationship between the urban and the rural, which are often seen as binaries, as being two completely different, completely opposite kind of uh, situations. Whereas we know that that's not necessarily the case. And in fact, trying to build towards both cities and villages of dignity, we need to see how those, I'm asking whether in fact that kind of a binary should be broken down. What then would be the relationship between the urban and the rural that could lead to dignity in both places? So if any of the panelists would like to reflect on that. Thank you. Something that comes up for me immediately is the rural context in, for me, as a, a black bodied man, a diasporic African in America, the rural context for me uh, starts with the place where my ancestors come from. My mother's side, her people are from Kentucky, no, Kentucky and Mississippi. My father's side, um, his people are from North Carolina and South Carolina, small rural towns. To that point, one rural context is it's in the rural where a lot of our ancestral and indigenous points of identity and cultural practice still exist um, and can be found in terms of like legacy. So there is an intentionality for sure in my environmental and climate justice work, uh, we have this initiative called Up South, Down South, where we have been intentionally uh, deepening our bond with folks from Jackson, Mississippi, because so many people in Detroit, our people migrated from Mississippi. And doing that, one is the, as a point of decolonizing and ancestral, like re-ancestralizing. Um, another is, to more deeply, to be more sophisticated in the way that we actually look at the systemic issues. Um, and in particular, trace back the real origins and roots of what we think we're addressing or fighting today. Uh, yes, the one thing that both places tend to have in common, especially as it relates to black, uh, black body people, indigenous people in America, is poverty and lack of self-determined economic and um, socio-political infrastructure. So even though a rural scenario, it may seem, it may appear on the surface that there may be deeper challenges in creating economic infrastructure or socio-political infrastructure. And there are, and it's a bit easier in an urban scenario because you have more, um, can, there's, there's an easier, there's a more convenient access to technology. Um, in fact, the policies that are on the books in places like Detroit are policies that stem from the top of the 20th century, the, the end of the 19th century, policies that uh, were reflective of the 19th century in America, which was a time replete with slavery economy. So um, we'll, we'll, we'll stop there, but just really noting that on the first two um, points of connecting the rural to the urban, one is uh, to deepen ancestral connection and to reconnect with um, indigenous culture and practices. Uh, and then another is to be able to see the commonalities um, the socio-political and ec economic commonalities of both places, knowing that it's in that type of 
solidarity, that that translocal and transnational solidarity where hyperlocal solutions and innovations will will be birthed. Thank you, Bryce. Um, we have another author of the book here who has not been on the panel, but would like to answer to that question. This is Ana Rodriguez. She will talk in Spanish. So I invite you to use the interpretation button at the bottom of your screen and just switch to the, so that you, I think you don't have to do anything, right? The, the interpretation will come to this room in English, I guess. Anyway, I just wanted to warn you that she's going to speak Spanish. Anna, please go ahead. Anna is an author and a co-editor of the book, just wanted to say. Yes, that's right. Thank you, gracias. Una cotación, muchas gracias a todos. Thank you very much for this uh, presentation with, of this book, which has been a global effort. I think it's um, important uh, that what we are saying, uh, consider what the colleagues from India and others have said uh, regarding rural issues. Certainly, to include uh, the question about informality, um, cities like Quito in the Global South and many of the cases of this book, Cities of Dignity, uh, give visibility to something that is linked with something showed by uh, the COVID, something that was there and uh, that was uh, put forward as a struggle, global struggle in um, demanding rights. What those struggles meant in our case in Quito, we worked from a huge um, market of fresh food, uh, gathering thousands of workers in a, re in a network, uh, articulating rural and the city. But not only from the economic point of view or distribution of uh, food, but also as a way of organizing life in the city. We cannot consider uh, relations in one way uh, from um, the rural to the city, but rather we have to consider this space, uh, the space of uh, um, popular market, not only as a space of food, but as a place of social reproduction, Kicha language, of knowledge, ancestors' knowledge that have been there uh, for uh, centuries. So during these times, when we think about that, when we think about this book, we didn't have a lockdown or the pandemic. Uh, it was just a little group, so like ours, the global working group. But nowadays, it's a problem affecting a lot of people. It's more visible, and it is it becomes a, a policy a question. How can we, from those small cases, uh, showing that uh, the rural problem becomes a problem for the cities, in the case of Quito, more than a third of the population eats fresh food from those production systems and its condition uh, by two factors. They're not measures, so there's no measurement. Uh, they are criminalize, as our colleague uh, uh, Juliana from Brazil was saying. And from the other side, they are reinventing themselves. They are able to uh, build uh, the family, the economic, uh, the economics of the family in the rural and urban area. So it, uh, the issue now is much more visible. How can we we in this role as intermediaries of that uh, knowledge, how can we interact? 
eh, nuevas tendencias. Lefts, new trends. We have elections in different places in the world that are surprising. Uh, what is our role as intermediaries to uh, recenter the problem of rural, urban, and informality and to include it in the agenda of a new city? In the case of this dialogue that we have, we talk about a new proximity, how uh, local can be reproduced at a global level in exercises like this dialogue, how uh, we can do it when the global has been unable to answer those uh, problems. What is the role of these spaces? Uh, Juliana, very briefly, please, before we go to the questions from Sorry, just a quite brief comment because I was sharing here on the chat um, about how amazing it is the connections um, that we have transnationally. So Bryce was talking about how um, his connection with the ancestors. Indeed, um, the MTST, for, MTSTB, for example, one of the movements quoted in the book, their slogan is let's make Palmares again. again. And Palmares was a Maroon community um, in Brazil in the struggle against slavery. Uh, and most of Maroon communities are in our areas, but it's also is a connection between how ancestrality and our connection with um, the, our families who are still there in our areas and our communities are still there in our areas also feed and is part even in connection with struggles in urban spaces. So I was just a short comment about the amazingness of these connections in between different countries. Great, thanks, Rihanna. So uh, we have a a question, a very interesting question from Hansley Giuliano, who is actually connected to what Anna just said. And he says, or she says, the intro to the book highlighted the argument that struggles are not limited to the local or national level, but also fought on a global scale. How do you see the likely conduct of transnational action on this issue under the COVID-19 pandemic? whether or not a vaccine is forthcoming. Do you find that our current new normal communication setup is facilitating it or highlighting further resource inequalities for cross-country campaigns? How can they be addressed? So who of you would like to answer to Hensley? Um, Miriam? Go ahead. Yeah, if I yeah, if I may, I, I answered Hansley very briefly in the in the chat as well. Um, um, I think um, from 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 what I observe and also being involved in with different um, social movements that are engaged transnationally, um, we've been adjusting to the new normal situation in terms of either recalibrating our strategies as well as maximizing existing te technologies, even though they're very um, also unequal and also suspect um, um, because you know they're they're owned and controlled by um, by, men, by 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 the big corporations and big tech. Um, but I think um, one of the key things here is that um, movements are already trying to you know uh, internationally network, share learning, share solidarity. I think this initiative is one of them in terms of trying to learn um, what's ha what's happening with different parts of the world. However, I think the main challenge is that there indeed is no um, substitute to face-to-face -face and people-to-people -people interaction in which many of, of um, the cases that in our book have already in, in fact surveyed because you know it's 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 being with another person sharing that energy as well as learning from the histories there's no substitute in that uh, except the face-to-face -face interaction and unfortunately because of COVID-19 we couldn't do that. And the other challenge is that many of the grassroots communities, I think both in the global north, north and in the global south, still suffer from um, inequalities and um, asymmetries in terms of connections to the internet. And this is one of the main challenges, I think, in many of our communities here in the Philippines because um, you know, it's it's mainly privatized as well as um, connections are very bad. So it's hard to get them to even join webinars or, or calls because of, of the inequalities that, that, that exist. So, I mean, I don't have a, a sort of like a, a black and white answer to the question of Hansley, but I think social movements are trying to maximize as much as possible what's existing and as well as continue the struggle in terms of exposing both how um, inequalities are 
filtering down to different aspects of our daily lives and at the same time continuing the work of building alternatives by writing stories by you know um, whatever in whatever form to be able to show that in, indeed there are some movements uh, happening despite the COVID. <clears throat> Mauroka? Um, we have a question for um, the whole panel. Um, and it comes from uh, Zach Hayden, actually, who's out in Montgomery. And uh, he's involved with the Automata Free Clinic, which I briefly mentioned. Um, so please do check uh, his work. And it's uh, uh, featured in the book, Chapter 5. And uh, Zach has a very interesting question. He's asking all of you, um, can we discuss the role of popular education in your work? Yeah, right. Go ahead. Okay, so for me and many others in the movement community in Detroit, uh, pardon me, I'm taking this beret out of my daughter's hair as well as I'm talking. Um, so yeah, but for many of us, we acknowledge that we have, in a Western context, in a colonizer narrative, um, only a narrow range of intelligences or expressions of intelligence are acknowledged or validated um, in, a, in only particular modes of um, education, information dissemination are, are validated. Uh, it just so happens that these methods and modalities are always outside of our indigenous and ancestral cultural context. So popular education, what we call popular education is really for us just organic indigenous native um, learning collective learning, um, it is vital because one of our major issues to resolve in this 21st century or in this particular lifetime that we share together is the implications of colonial thinking and colonial uh, points of identity um, that have been implanted planted in diasporic African and indigenous populations around the planet and how that is the one of the main um, inhibitors to us fully, not only fully self-actualizing, but just on a more basic level, being able to orient properly and in a, in a synergistic way with our built environment, with the land and with our people. So, Yes, the phrase popular education is what's used um, to describe these ancestral and indigenous modalities for communicating and shared learning. Um, yet that's really at the core of what's going on is, is that. It's ancestral and indigenous forms of communicating and sharing information with each other. Thanks, Bryce. Then we have a question here for Asume. Uh, from Ananta Krishnan. I lived in Nigeria for four years, just wondering how the much reported floating school of Makoko has been adopted by the Lagos state government as a model that'll be used for developing the houses on water in the community. At the same time, poor quality water, mosquitoes, which thrive in nearby lagoons and dangerous jobs, all serve to impact on people's health in Makoko. So the question is, how are these issues addressed by Lagos government and the community and the UN agencies in Nigeria? Asume, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, the, the, the floating school is, uh, was one of the most celebrated uh, developments in the whole Marco core, the, the, the partnerships between the community and, uh, and different groups, including um, a, a few NGOs. 
international development agencies, uh, the, the floating school was uh, celebrated as an architectural wonder of some of some sort. Uh, Kunle Adeyemi, uh, an architect, designed the, the, the school. It was uh, funded by consortia of uh, development agencies as a, as a pilot. Um, the interesting thing is that uh, while the, the floating school was celebrated outside, outside Makoko, uh, the people in Makoko themselves were a little bit hesitant about, about the, the school, about the, the structure, the structural integrity of, of, the, of the building. Um, these are people who had better knowledge of, of the geography, um, and they didn't feel that uh, the, the school was going to be secure enough uh, in, in difficult weather. And they were right because the school collapsed. Um, it completely collapsed and it was a good thing that there was nobody at the time uh, in, in, in the building and so nobody was hurt. The collapse of uh, the floating school basically ended uh, that, 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 that idea. And that is why it is important that uh, even as there is need to, to consider innovation, uh, innovation, and that there should be participation of the community people, even in design, in the design process. Because if the architects, if the architects had con considered the views uh, of, uh, of community people, it is possible that a different structure, a different will have emerged and you know to, to have a more durable, durable building, but that is not that is not the case. Uh, so the, the the collapse of that pilot, the, the, the floating school, uh, seemed to have um, ended that a, a lot of discussion about that kind of possibility. That kind of uh, possibly in terms in, in terms of uh, what is happening now in in Makoko and and, and, and similar places, uh, the hard life, you know, from from our perspective, if you are outside, you are looking look, looking in, you see that this, this the people have not have access do not have access to to health infrastructure, health services, to even you know the you know the kind of schools that the people elsewhere. Uh, used to that remains the same. What has been the response of the Lagos state government? It has been pretty much the the, the same. Uh, uh, the people in places like Makoko do not really matter to the government. There are NGOs and some you know uh, international agencies that still continue to have a presence in 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 Makoko, doing implementing different projects. Sometimes in solidarity and partnership. With sections of the community, you know, and that is still ongoing. But what is fundamental from our point of view uh, is uh, the need to go beyond uh, incremental amelioration and project tab developments, like the floating school represents, uh, to work with the people, not just in Makoko, but in other marginalized community to build real popular power uh, that will translate into political change, to translate into the kind of system, the kind of democratic system that will be more representative of the aspirations of all people. And it is only when we have that change at the political level. I'm not saying that increment, incremental change is not needed. That no se necesite un cambio incremental en sentido de en responder a las necesidades directas ambientales. And to look also at the, at the participation. And that brings to mind, just to, to add to what Bryce said concerning you know, the question about uh, popular ed ed education, popular education in the case of Makoko uh, uh, and, and, and other such locations all over the country is something that is, that is ongoing, that will try to promote understanding that popular education shouldn't be something that is taught based on a template um, and that there's a co-learning and the mutual learning. But there has to be, I mean, from our perspective, some idea 
uh, of uh, history and uh, idea of uh, anti-colonial, anti-colonial messaging and anti-capitalist messaging. And this is in the, 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 in the context of popular education, uh, some of the challenges that we face, you know, is, uh, you know, how to determine what, what, what to be the subject, what to be, what to be the focus of, 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 of education. Uh, what is the alternative? Uh, we have a situation. We have a situation where some of the people that are part of the popular education processes, including uh, my comrade who who co-authored the chapter, Bedou Arimu, is very very active with the Amilcar Cabral Ideological School in Lagos. In fact, he is the founder, the coordinator of the most probably the most the most active popular education uh, organization in in Lagos, the Amilcar Cabral Ideological School. Part of the challenges we are facing is that we have. You know, all of us we have not been able to identify to point to a, to a a concrete set of alternatives in terms of what the the future, the futures, the society that we want to build. You know, people have come from uh, backgrounds in in all kinds of Marxisms and all kinds of orthodoxies, and you know, sometimes you know, they still to recreate even the, the ideas and ideas in terms of what we see for the future, that is something that we still work in progress that we need to do, you know, to, to deal with the theory, uh, even as we deal with, with, with the practice. Thanks, Asume. Um, so I would like to ask, to take one last question from the public, asking the panelists to check what is there, what else, and maybe respond in writing what we cannot respond orally here. Um, so Milun Kotari says, thanks for the great, great presentations. Are you all familiar with the detailed work that has been done by the UN, NGOs, academics, and so forth, using the human rights approach in analyzing the global urban crisis and in promoting the mobilization of movements and campaigns? A number of standards have been developed on the rights to housing and against displacement that can be of use. Also, the work on racial discrimination as a determinant of your urban polarization. A number of UN mechanisms are very focused on the these issues. Are you of, are any of you using these standards and mechanisms? And do you find the human rights approach useful for your work? That was from Milun Kotari, I guess from India. And I would like to ask Marianne first to answer this. Yeah, thank you very much, Miriam and Meloon, um, for your answer. I haven't been following um, closely uh, this development around um, uh, the human rights, ap rights approach in analyzing the global urban um, crisis. But I do know that many of the human rights um, that we know of right now are actually rooted from many people's struggles. And in fact, human rights in itself are evolving concept. The very idea of right to the city wasn't even imagined maybe 10, 20 years ago. And now it's one of the key things that the UN and even um, you know the, the United um, Local and city government council have been talking about. So that's one one idea, one way in, in which um, the human rights is being pushed bo both by movements and being adopted by the, by the UN. So in a way, um, at least in our book chapter, in, 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 in the survey that we did, we found out that many of the, social, the, so, the people's um, movements and, and popular struggles are using human rights in their work. They might not use human rights as in the normative sense of the UN, but they are referring to people's rights. Because as we know, many governments don't recognize uh, human rights in a sense. And in, even with the, with the rise of right-wing um, populist governments, uh, you know, human rights is, has, has become a taboo. But I think the movements are also saying, and many of these radical urban transformations are going beyond human rights. It's, it's, the, it's the floor. It shouldn't be the ceiling. It's just the floor. It's the basic things that you should have. But you have to go beyond that. And I think that's where I suppose the limits as well as the potential of human rights are in terms of pushing for radical urban transformation. It's a starting point, but you have to go beyond it. Juliana, you seem to want to add something to this. Am I right? <laughs> no, I actually don't feel yeah I, yeah I do have some experiences if they the union uh the United Nations but I think that Mary said very clearly I was just really okay. happy to hear the thing so I'm not I'm gonna abstain today great 
Great. So now this would be an invitation to our panelists. If any one of you, we won't do a last round. I'm just inviting if maybe Sandeep or anyone wants to have last words. Uh, and then we will have an announcement from the Global Tapestry of Alternatives and we will say goodbye. <laughs> there is a, I don't know if Bryce could respond to this question about um, the last, when you wrap up, if you can respond to Anantia who says, Detroit is a city, uh, uh, is regenerative itself, regenerating itself from decline after the issue of the auto industry, is a model using art and culture contributing to commercial and cultural vitality, urban streetscapes, accessing and convenience, and ethics and social diversity while preventing gentrification. I think probably he's asking, is it enough to prevent gentrification? Thank you. So, yeah, so. Pardon, Very me. brief, Bryce, or yeah, Bryce. I don't know how we have two speakers. <laughs> yeah, su um, super brief. Um, yeah, and then we pass to you, Sandeep, okay? Yeah. Thank you, Sandeep and Miriam. Um, no, no, it's not enough to stop gentrification, uh, which is why I'm doing this project, Hood Close to Gentrifiers. To me, what's most important in this moment in the 21st century is to create a, a container for a sophisticated conversation where we thoroughly unpack uh, economic, sociopolitical, and architectural violence and the modality which has been engineered, which we call gentrification to perpetuate those things. Um, just as a context for what are the new stories and the new narratives of self-determined diasporic African um, and indigenous land use, um, neighborhood development. Like let's uplift those stories so that we're present in the new models and the new practices. Um, we can start to acknowledge our own wins, so to speak. And then from there, um, we are cultivating our identity, um, more deeply cultivating our identity as the architects, as the designers, as the custodians of our environment. To me, that is the thing and being able to do that work and scale it um, across hyperlocals, um, transnationally, that work at scale is what for me will move the needle and begin to shift the paradigm, uh, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> Great, thanks. Sandy, please. Yeah, so I just wanted to uh, uh, try and put the whole thing into uh, kind of a perspective again in terms of uh, why are we doing this? We are doing this because we believe that there is another way or uh, the, the world can be a far more humane place to live in. And a lot of the values that the communities that we work with, uh, 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 especially those ones that are talking about building social capital or uh, constantly looking at the end product as building relationships at a spiritual level, uh, looking at the ways in which we see God in one another. And uh, 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 it's, it's completely dramatically opposed to the way uh, the markets and the capitalist systems have uh, developed these cities today, which is of, uh, of looking at end products as material gains. And uh, very often the communities in the cities that we live with and work with they also need to be sometimes reminded of the origins from which they have uh, tried to come and uh, develop a new different kind of way of living in this world today. And uh, so uh, 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 at all times, if we are reinforcing a very different value system, it doesn't matter who holds it. Very often today, you find a lot of very young urban people uh, who are so, so to speak, uh, from the richer communities are actually beginning to realize the, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the mockery of the way this world has been, uh, has, 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 has been built. And they are sometimes actually moving more towards the poorer communities and their values. And some of the uh, young people in our slums or those communities are moving towards material gain. So it's really a question of holding on to the values and not the people and the constituencies that we must constantly remind ourselves when we are doing this kind of work. I'll stop yeah. over there. 
I very much agree with those last words. The struggle is about what do we understand by quality of life, by a good life? How do we better our relations so that we can thrive? Um, thanks. Thank you very much, Sandeep. So, um, yeah, I think this is the moment to thank you all to have joined this webinar. Also, the people who have joined it through the Facebook accounts, for example, of in Delhi of the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation. And uh, to hand over to Ashish Kotari, our colleague and comrade from the GTA, who wants to announce where else you can have interesting subjects to participate in dialogues. And of course, I invite you to download the book, please, from the web page we posted. Maybe Mabroka, you can post it again in the chat if someone got in late. It is totally free for download and we hope that you put it into circulation and that you use it in your processes because this is what it's for. Ashish. Thanks, Miriam. This has been a wonderful collaboration, but uh, I think the ending from our side is going to be by Shishti. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> Sorry then. <laughs> um, no, it has been a great conversation. So thank you for co-organizing this um, dialogue. It was such a tremendous learning. And uh, uh, Sandeep ji has anyway uh, given it a very beautiful conclusion. So just want to announce that our next dialogue will be on the 17th of December. Um, by a group of academics uh, working towards alternatives to capitalism. They will be talking to us about how do we conceptualize alternatives and grounding themselves with several examples um, from across the world. So do follow us uh, here on this link for um, upcoming webinars and hoping to see many of you who have joined us earlier also joining us today and in the future webinars. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you very much, Shristi. Thank you again to all the people who have made this happen, especially to the team of the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation in Brussels. Thanks to the authors for having created this great book and see you soon again in some creative spaces, <laughs> hopefully also in person. <laughs> Thank you everybody. Peace. Yeah. Bye. Thank you.